Hello and thanks for joining us. This week, two of the world's major powers choose their leaders and what it means for us. Well, President Obama secured his second term last week, while China's leadership changes this week. The race for the White House of the United States was a real cliffhanger. Obama is back with a trim majority of the popular vote, but his Republican opponents still hold sway in the House of Representatives, and the nation is still speeding towards a fiscal cliff. At the end of this year, the Bush-era tax cuts expire, and major federal spending cuts will take effect if President Obama can't get the Republicans and Democrats to agree on a new formula to curb the US government's growing deficit and debts. Meanwhile, the results of the Communist Party leadership elections in Beijing, while it's more predictable, but the outcome is just as uncertain. China's new leadership is also facing challenges at home and abroad. There are domestic investment and corruption problems, exports are squeezed by recession in key offshore markets, and tensions are rising between China and Japan over their competing claims for offshore islands. So what's ahead for New Zealand? Darren allen has been pursuing that question with former Prime Minister, former New Zealand Ambassador to the United States, and the current Chair of the New Zealand United States Council, Jim Bolger. Welcome to the studio, Jim Bolger. Pleasure. Thank you for coming in. Delighted to be here. Last week, the election was sold to us as a cliffhanger, and of course it turned out to be anything but. Were you surprised at the outcome? You've got to recall, I coined the phrase, bugger the pollsters, and they've been wrong more times than they're right. I think there was great uncertainty as how this was going to go. Just about every leader that has come up for re-election at this stage with the global financial crisis has been thrown out. So in many ways, the Obama victory was remarkable in the sense that America's clearly got a financial crisis, but he survived and, as you say, survived very comfortably in the end with the electoral votes, electoral college votes, much closer on the personal votes, but he won that as well, uh, which is more than uh, George Bush did back in 2000 when he beat Al Gore. So from the Obama team point of view, from the president himself, uh, this was a remarkable victory and uh, the pundits will have to go away and sort of look at their stargazing once more and try and get it better next time. The whole election debate um, over, you know, the couple of years that it seemed to drag on really showed up a divide between the Republicans and the Democrats. It's more than that. And, yeah, and the election results mm. showed it too. A really divided America. Is that how you see it? Oh, it is very divided on some issues, and, and that's quite bad. Uh, but you analyse the results and you'll see that uh, Governor Romney won the white male vote, he won the white female vote. President Ob Obama won virtually everything else. In other words, he got the uh, Hispanics, he got the blacks, he got all the ethnic minority groups. And the young. And he got the young vote. So uh, this is a very comprehensive victory, but I was talking to others and saying, we've got to remind ourselves that America is a united country, all people are created equal. The great Jefferson's words in the Declaration, in the Constitution, you know, we're all equal. Of course, it's nonsense, they had slavery at that stage. Uh, and they've only had total equality, in other words, a banned segregation, only 50 years ago. We're yeah. not talking about an America that's got a deep root into the equality of their citizens. It's only with some reluctance that in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson's at present got through uh, the, the legislation to ban uh, segregation. So in some ways they've done remarkably well, and you have to say there's still more to be done. Is, has the Republican Party got a lot of work to do, do you Absolutely. think, to survive as a party in America? Well, they will survive as a party, but they've got to really rethink where they're going. I mean, they, I think, have been um, damaged, badly damaged, by attaching themselves to the extreme right wing, as it's called. It's got many views and attitudes. But the extreme right wing do not represent the broad base of American values. And uh, Mr Romney, who uh, governed as a moderate, centrist, Republican governor in Massachusetts for many years successfully, then dashed all the way to the right to get the Tea Party vote to win the nomination and it was trying to come back to the centre. I think that confused people. They didn't quite know what the governor stood for and I think that was damaging. And, and of course one of the outcomes of the election mm. last week is in fact of course that Obamacare is called and the big health reform, the big battleground will now of course continue and uh, it'll be there permanently. And yeah. All Americans should welcome that, whether they know it at this stage or not, that everybody's going to have health care coverage. We think that's 
sort of we basic take it for granted, and but and I know. It's just as norm. Yeah. Mm. Now Americans will have it too. Yeah. Are the lessons in terms of that divide, the political divide between the young, the Hispanics, the blacks in America, and the, the sort of right-wing whites, for this country in terms of the way politics... Always learn. Uh, always learn from others. Uh, Prime Minister John Key has been remarkably successful in reaching across most divides in New Zealand. I think he has been extraordinarily successful in that space. But if you step back from one individual, New Zealanders collectively must not allow themselves to be divided, particularly on the grounds of race. And I think, fortunately, we have moved significantly past it. Now, all the Maori settlements, treaty settlements that I was involved in as Prime Minister, and I still do work in that space, I think Chris Finlayson's doing an extraordinary job there, that were quite divisive. And I can recall being told, don't give away the race vote, Jim, you know, which I said I will never be a racist. I psychologically can't be a racist, yeah. it just is not in me. Uh, but there were people who said, you know, you keep that card up your sleeve. I think New Zealand's gone past it. I'm very hopeful we've gone past it. Are we accommodating enough of the immigrants who come into our community in terms of giving them a voice in our parliament? Uh, immigrants always struggle to get a voice in the early part of their arrival, and I think Sadly, that's probably going to continue. But I think we have to be more welcoming of immigrants. Look, we are going to require more. We've got an aging population, you know, there's more people like <laughs> me. We've got an aging population. This is the great challenge for the Western developed world. Mm. It's a great opportunity. I mean, the greatest thing in the world has happened with modern medicine, modern science, modern nutrition. We all Keep live longer. Alive. Yep. But we've got to adjust policies to reflect that we live longer. We've got to look at our retirement age and all of those sorts of things, and they're not complex. Are you talking about moving superannuation? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I you moved. Think it should at, be done. I moved to when I was prime minister from age sixty, the entitlement age sixty to sixty-five. We have to go higher. And we survived. And of course, we survived. I mean, it's, it's so totally logical with an older society. So what? Would you move it up now to seventy? Well, I think you do in a couple of stages, but it'll inv inevitably it'll end up seventy happen. plus somewhere out there. We continue to add to the longevity of people, it's going to go 70 plus, that should be a cause of enormous celebration. Mm. You know, go to Keep a meeting. people go, active in the community longer. Yeah. That's right, go to a meeting and ask them who wants to die younger. Mm. You don't get many takers. So the fact that we're living longer because of a whole range of things I've touched on, that's wonderful. Yeah. Obama said in his acceptance speech last week that the best was yet to come. But you have to wonder, since he's, got a, he's still got a, a, um, a Congress, that divided. is not going to want a line dance with them. Mm. Um, they've got the fiscal um, cliff, which mm. is rearing its ugly head. What's likely to happen there, and what impact will it have on us? I think two points there. One is President Obama has been re-elected, historic in many ways. Historic to win as a black American, and historic to be re-elected in times of financial crisis. So he has really extraordinary moral strength behind him, and he can't be re-elected. So, he has all the power on his side of the fence. Yes, he's got a divided Congress. He had that before. I think this Congress will be more accommodating. I believe the president will reach out. Do you think it will be? Yes, I think it will be. Because Why? I think because the Republican absolute determination to make Obama fail, fail. failed. Yeah. Failed. But are they still not going to keep on trying, do you think? No, no. I think they will be back looking at themselves and saying, we should have won this election if we had done it properly because the American economy isn't in pretty difficult times. We should have won it. We didn't. Our policies and our approach was wrong. And I think Americans want more collaboration. The fiscal cliff will force it. If it doesn't get addressed, of course, they cut a trillion off the defense spending or something. They're not going to do that. So they will address it. And again, uh, everyone talks about whether there should be more tax or less tax. They have to make the tax system more fair. They have to get more revenue. Apple, the big Apple giant corporation I saw in yesterday's or last week's paper, it paid 2% of its revenue in taxes. You know, I mean, it's grossly it unfair. Sense. No, it's grossly unfair. Mm. And, and so the tax system has to be made fair. If you do that, they'll probably get enough revenue in. But there will be changes in the taxes. It's as sure as night follows day. They'll have to look at some of their spending. I believe they'll have to look at their defence spending. They spend an extraordinary percentage of their economy compared with others on defence. And I think they'll have to look at that as well. Do you really believe they'll get Congress on their side on that? They have to. See, the fiscal cliff forces them to. I mean, 
sometimes, you know, looking but stuck. But they're not, the, some of the Republicans are likely to be pretty bitter about losing the election. Well, they'll be election. terribly bitter, but he doesn't and need all the Republicans. He just needs the sensible ones in the centre of this term. And, and there are a lot of sensible Republicans. And I believe that they will put together the coalition across the, across the aisle to bring together a budget package okay. that'll work. And so that we won't, in the end, end up sort of going further into recession as a well, result of it, hopefully. Well, willing. I mean, if America goes into recession, the rest of us are going into recession. Mm. It's still the largest economy in the world. I know it's comforting to argue, and then there's some logic to argue, that the uh, real election, of course, is the new president of China. That's the Absolutely. one we should look at. Absolutely, we're going to come to that in a minute. We are, we are definitely. But just before we leave that, do you think that the election of Obama was good for New Zealand? Yes. In terms of just keeping things going along? Two or three things. I think good for New Zealand in terms of continuity and stability, but I think good for New Zealand. I, I would be fearful that um, the Vice President, Paul Ryan, was going to try and be too uh, aggressive in contracting the deficit in a hurry and push the US economy into recession, which uh, then would be bad for us, of course. I think that uh, President Obama has a, um, a ongoing commitment to trade reform, which is good for New Zealand, Trans-Pacific Partnership, all that sort of stuff. So TPP, I think, what's going to happen there? I mean, that I think we'll move forward now with a greater commitment. Uh, we have been, we the collective, have been you know, paddling water a little bit. The next meeting is here in Auckland. In December. In December. But a lot of people feel that, in fact, I mean, it's been going on for so long, and there are many areas of that agreement that people don't like, they're very uneasy with. Well, the biggest one from the American side is patent rights, patent law and all that, and they're very, very excited about and that. And the pharmacy. They've got, they do well, the same pace. Yeah. There's thousands of lawyers over there, uh, pour over this and make their livelihood out of it. Uh, but I'm optimistic, I have to say. I think there are real challenges, but I think the, uh, the opportunities it provides, the number of countries that have lined up, and some of those are going to be difficult because you take the Canadian dairy approach and all the rest of it, it's a million miles from New Zealand or Australia or whatever. So it'll be hard, but easier. None of these trade policies are never easy. And uh, everybody knows, of course, one of the historic transformations that are going on in the world, which is not talked about often. We talk about jobs going from uh, New Zealand, the United States, Australia, wherever, Europe, into the emerging nations of the world led by China, but elsewhere as well. And that's correct. But you could argue from one point of view that's a sort of an equalizing of the wealth of the world. It's all been uh, locked up in a handful of countries, and now a few others are getting a share of it. And uh, it's hard to argue that's unfair or wrong. So. Uh, at a high philosophical level, you could say some of that transfer is necessary and we should welcome it. But do we actually need to be in a free trade arrangement with the states, which many see as being detrimental but to our own sovereignty? No, I don't think it's detrimental but to our sovereignty. We've got Pharmac being looked upon by the pharmacy companies in the states. Oh, they've looked at it from terms, day one. Yeah, but in terms of what they can order and what they can't, what kind of medicines we can have? No, they've looked at it since day one. Just remember that Australia's got a free trade agreement with the United States and they kept their model of pharma. Of pharma. Mm. And, and there's no reason why we can't do the same. I mean, we just will be telling the Americans, I'm sure we uh, will and have, that uh, you know that's not on the table. We're not negotiating that. That is our sovereign right to determine how we buy medicine for New Zealanders. And we are going to try to do it in the best possible way. Give and you think wine. we'll succeed yes. in that? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's essential that we do succeed in that. And uh, when I was in Washington, you know, we had discussions with the pharmacy industry. Oh, yes, they're very big and powerful. And I think there's a lesson of the willingness of big, powerful corporations to push back. And the advertising on uh, television that we're seeing now yeah. uh, by British American Tobacco trying to persuade the government or bludgeon the government into changing its approach to reduce the consumption of tobacco is a, a reminder that big business, the big corporates are prepared to use every step possible, every means possible, to push back. But uh, I'm totally confident that John Key and his team will hold the line on, on farming. We'll have to wait and see on that one. The pivot that the Americans talked about making during um, the Obama a team talked about back into the Pacific, mm. uh, do you think that's really going to happen? It is. I think the more important question is why? Yeah. Why is America moving more yeah. of its military capacity into our peaceful part of the world? The That's Pacific, right. Peaceful. Putting into Darwin, troops well, into Darwin. What are the purpose of troops in Darwin? I think these are very legitimate questions, if I was in the rest of Asia, that I would be asking. 
Uh, is there a strategy there, and the, the term that comes up, is, is this part of some ambition of somebody in the hierarchy in Washington, Washington military establishment to contain whatever that means, contain China? China? Uh, well, there's a few things we've got to understand. For 18 of the last 20 centuries, that's an awful long time, China was the largest economy in the world and clearly will regain that position relatively soon. So China is going to be a dominant player in the world. And it's and not going away from... There's no containment of it. I mean, India was the second largest economy in the world. And, and they've gone through difficult times and that, but India will also be a dominant. You've, you've got the Brazils of the world and all those are going to be huge economies. So we wouldn't want to have some false ambition to retain what I describe as the existing status quo, that somehow the hierarchy of nations are like they are now and we must maintain that for all time, because that won't happen. Like CETO, which is, what, 60 years old? Oh, I mean, right. is it still relevant? Well, who knows, frankly. I mean, who, who, I mean it, who's heard of it in recent times? <laughs> I mean, it, in all honesty, see, Australia produced its white paper on sort of reordering it, how it faces Asia, particularly how it faces the China. The century is Asia's, yes. China's. There, there was a, a, a dean of a law school, or I think it's a business school, rather, in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, University in Singapore, who wrote an article which paraphrased it down to this. New Zealand and Australia are 24 million people, add us both together, and to our north there are 3.5 billion Asians. Uh, we better get along with them because uh, that's yeah. a reasonably powerful argument. So the US moving into the Pacific, I welcome the US in the Pacific, obviously they're a Pacific nation, there's no issue on that. But if they're going to move more of the military here, I think there are legitimate questions to be asked. Why are they doing that? What is the end game? And what would you say the end game would I be? I don't know. You I really don't know? In all honesty, no. I don't you know. You don't think it is to contain China? Well, it won't work if To it face is. off? No, that would be, be a totally false proposition if they think that's what's going to happen. Uh, you'd want to watch some military planners anywhere around the world, you know, but uh, uh, that would be a false ambition. Because China is, you know, within the next 20 years, it'll overtake um, yes, the exactly. U.S. As, as number one economy in the world. Mm. Um, but so it should, a, with 1,300 million people. That's right, and they've got the change of leadership taking place mm -hmm. at the moment. How important to that is that to us? You could argue the uh, installing of President Xi in China is a bigger deal for the world mm. and for us than the re-election of President Obama in Washington. Uh, because of the enormous importance that China is going to play in the next decade, and he will be there almost certainly for a decade. So we need to maintain, and New Zealand's very fortunate in this space, under whatever government we've had in New Zealand in the last 50 years, we have maintained and deepened and grown our relationship with China. So we got there early. I think that's recognised by the Chinese. We, uh, I think our anti-nuclear stance, which of course was a Labour Party initiative, uh, gave us standing that we weren't going to just follow one country or another. No, yeah. we would have our own views on issues and yeah. we have continued to have our own views on issues and we're not going to change our nuclear legislation or any of those sorts of things. I think that's all accepted, but I think our relationship, we signed the first free trade agreement with China, we acknowledge them as a, a, trading society, a trading entity long before many other countries did, and all of that. So we must maintain the very sensible balance we've got now. We respect both countries, we work with both countries, we admire both countries, and let's get on with it. Do you think we're doing enough to keep, you know, to walk that, that oh, balance? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think we are. I think we've been uh, Do you think, but as a country, sensible. our attitude towards China, you know, we've had real problems about letting them come in and, and you know, using land and things like that. Well, Do I think we that, see China yeah. as a part of our future story? Well, I think, go uh, back to the... Uh, Crafer Farms, which was frankly badly handled. I mean, uh, it went through the officials and I think they found it difficult to find what was special in this application, so it went on for months and months and months and months. That's bad, bad practice. Uh, but in terms of welcoming foreign capital when it's going to add something to New Zealand, not just do the same as we're doing. We want people with ideas, entrepreneurs, all the rest of it, and investment capital, no question. Uh, but we want to see what they're going to do extra just replacing a New Zealander with uh, some foreigners is not enough in itself. So that was the argument there. Uh, but the bigger question, have we sold to New Zealanders, we the collective, the importance of immigrants to our future? Mm. And they would almost certainly come from non-European countries in the future, most of them, 
Um, no, I don't think we have. I think we've just accepted it and thought it let it happen by osmosis, but perhaps we should be out there more on the front foot, selling the benefits of having a New Zealand. Go back to those figures I gave you. New Zealand that's multicultural. We are a small European enclave, we're less European than we were, of course, 50 years ago. But we in Australia have small European enclaves in the Asia Pacific. An accident of history, if you like, or early explorers yeah. out of Europe. And I think we're now both realising, we look at the globe a little more often perhaps and see where we are in the globe and say, gosh, we're not Europe, are we? No, we're part of Asia, part of Pacific. But that's the interesting thing, isn't it? We don't teach Chinese in our schools. Not enough. I no. Think we do teach some. We do, yes, but it's, you know, probably in the schools. In mini school, yep. yeah. Um, should we be doing more yes. to make New Zealanders aware that Asia is our future? But it's always challenging. Now, I think teaching Mandarin is not that challenging. But for a while there, everybody was learning Japanese, including some, yep. of, some of my family. You yeah. know. And I've said to them, bad call should be Mandarin. But no, so Japan at that stage was a dominant economy in the world. And they're going through, frankly, they're going through the problems that all countries are going to go through with aging populations. And we mm. have to be funded. That's why we will need more immigrants. And uh, the New Zealand Herald a few months back wrote, I thought, a very brave editorial and said we should welcome the refugees. These are the ones who have shown the courage to, to leave and risk yeah. and take all the risk and knowing that the lives are at risk. So we may not do that, but I think we should look at that. So we will need them. We need to prepare New Zealanders who still perhaps have a Eurocentric view of the yeah. world or a North American view of the world that that is not tomorrow. The world is going to be multicultural, multi-ethnic. Take the example I use. Our closest Asian neighbour is Indonesia, the largest Muslim, Muslim country, country in the world. Yep. We should do more to have New Zealanders understand the Muslim communities of the world. This is obviously many Muslim people in New Zealand, a small minority. But we, we have to understand them. We, we mustn't only have the prism that we see them through of terrorists, you know. And that sadly is what many people see. Uh, this is a fast-growing population worldwide. The largest group of them are our neighbours in the Pacific. We need to know more about it. During the American election campaign, um, China came in for a few stiff hits from both sides. What's the relationship going to be like internationally between China and America, do you think? I think once they've got away now from the hustings, the election's over, uh, President Obama's re-elected, I think they'll come back, what I described to normal. I, I think there were some unfortunate things said, uh, particularly by Mr. Romney. Um, fortunately, uh, perhaps he doesn't have to follow through on those, so the world's in a better place. Yeah. I think the most important relationship you could argue now is between a re-elected President Obama and the new President Xi of China. Mm. And for those two gentlemen and their respective teams to get alongside each other and get to understand each other, I mean, that's really what the world needs. And what we in New Zealand need is for those two giants of economy. I mean, whether America is number one or number two somewhere out there into the future, they are the dominant economies in the world and will continue to be so for a long time. But the uh, election of the leadership in China is often seen as, because it's not a democracy, mm. a Western democracy, therefore it's suspect. Mm. But it's as legitimate as Obama? In their terminology, it's totally legitimate. Uh, again, I think we have perhaps a more limited view of China's political structure than perhaps is real. I mean, they have a quite genuine democracy at lower levels and village and, and villages there's 100,000 people, remember, yeah. you know, yeah. we're not talking 10 yeah. people. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of agitation and protest at low levels in, in China. You know, they, uh, we again tend to look at Tiananmen Square of decades back, I mean, tragedy beyond belief. Yeah. I don't think you'll ever see that again. I think uh, China's moved all past that. Would we like to see a more open democracy? Of course we would. Will they get there? I believe absolutely. Do you, do you oh, actually yes. do believe they will? Yeah, of course they, they will. will. I mean, the force will stay. come from underneath. Do you think so? Well, of course it will, because the, the Chinese soft power. people... Yeah, the soft power of the people. The, the people see the world and they want to have a say in it. In many ways, if you go back and, and look at how China developed, after they took over in 49, the communists took over, and then when they had 26 years of Mo, I think 27 years, and then they moved to the new leadership, who was about 75 or something at the time, mm -hmm. young fella. Yeah. And, uh, and he went and spent a lot of time talking to Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Yeah. 
And Lee Kuan Yew, of course, had a quite dictatorial approach, some would suggest, but he produced remarkable results in Singapore, and I think that influenced the Chinese model very substantially. Uh, they have not been as successful as Singapore. Singapore is a fully functioned democracy now, but I think that uh, you will see China moving that way because of the soft power of the people. The internet is all pervasive. Knowledge is almost unstoppable, no matter what the dictates of the top might be. But they still certainly try to stop it. Oh, yes. You know, I mean, censorship in yeah, they will. China is extraordinary. And, uh, and they will, and they'll try, and uh, all of that, but I uh, have total confidence. What's the in time frame in your life's time? Oh, yes. And I <laughs> You're going to live a long time. <laughs> I'm going to live a long time. <laughs> <laughs> How else can I keep annoying people? <laughs> Um, will they, in turn, China, you know, taking its place in the world, a lot of the institutions that we have been dealing with since the Second World War, the United Nations, world trade, all these things, were, had a Western concept. Correct. Are they going to have to change yes. to accommodate the likes of China? Yes, absolutely. They had a Western concept, they had more than a Western, they had the victor's concept. Yeah. Those who won, in inverted commas, World War II Made were the, the ones who put them all there. Yeah. A and uh, so we have a security council that reflects one part of the world and not the rest. And China is there, of course, that, uh, because they were supporting the uh, Western allies, if we call them that. Uh, so, but they, they will all have to evolve. The World Trade Organization has been moribund now for a number of years. It can't get the great Doha development around sort of out of State. And that's really because of China too, isn't it? Well, anyway. all sorts of things. And, mm -hmm. no, so we've got to get, we, we see what's happening in Syria, yeah. and, and we have uh, China and Russia both saying, well, we can't do much about that, or words to that effect. Can so China stay with that sort of attitude towards those conflicts, though? Well, I would imagine with not defending whatever their position might happen to be. I'd imagine they don't see any easy way to a better end, and I'm not sure anybody else does now. I think, I think what the whole of the Arab Spring has shown, that transition from a dictatorial regime to a more open democratic one is difficult, challenging. And I mean, that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. And I think, go back to your question whether there'll be change in China, they, nobody thought all those dictators in the Middle East were going to go. You know, yeah. had this, we had yeah. this conversation three years ago, we would not have been prophesizing that they will all be gone, mm. and the last one standing is Syria, who will clearly go. go. It's yeah. just a matter of the manner of the going, and I see uh, in the last uh, few days, uh, Prime Minister Cameron of Britain saying, well, if he wants to go, somebody will give him a safe haven somewhere, if that's the best way out. I think that's probably what will happen. Mm find a way out. That's going to be interesting, isn't it? It is. You're a Republican at heart, aren't you? You mean Republican that New Zealand should become a Republic or a Republican yes. voter in the United States? No, 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 States? no. Oh, no. Just, yeah, just <laughs> in terms of New Zealand. Oh, yes, I think we should. I've made that very clear. I think New Zealand should move to the position where we elect our own head of state. It seems totally logical. I mean, it's, it, it's somewhat quaint, I suppose, that we have our head of state, uh, hereditary monarch, 12,000 miles away. How many kilometres is that? I mean, it's a long time since I went to no. school. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I have enormous respect for Queen Elizabeth II. I think she's a remarkable woman. She's done a remarkable job. I've had the great privilege of meeting her many, many times. So this has nothing to do with not liking or disliking no, anybody. No, no, it's just actually it's a question we are. of where we evolve ourselves. Mm. And we have, we've been on a journey of evolution from a colony. And uh, we've had our own self-governing state for an awful long time. I just think, that I think I said, gave it this in a speech when the Prime Minister in Parliament shocked a whole lot in the National Party, and, and, and said that the, a whole bunch of things, we should have our final court of appeal in New Zealand, that happened, you know. Yeah. We should have our own honour system, that happened. We should finally move to elect our own head of state, that will happen. And we'll fit them better in the Asian century. Well, of course we will, but mm. it's, it's, it's even bigger than that. It's who we are as a people. Who do we see ourselves, and now that we are realizing, I think much more so than in the past, that we are part of the Asia Pacific and we're not part of Europe. Great friends that they are. Yeah. Look, my contact, obviously, I'm a first generation New Zealander. I mean, uh, you know, when I'm not in New Zealand, I'm an Irishman. You know, so, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's what will happen and you can debate the time. Won't happen now till Her Majesty has uh, completed her remarkable reign, is my judgment now, but yeah. it will happen. Well, I won't ask you whether you're going to any of the royal uh, you shouldn't do that because I won't, no. <laughs> Jim Bolger, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, my pleasure. Darren Shanahan speaking with former Prime Minister and current Chair of the New Zealand United States Council, Jim Bolger. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for your company. We're back same time next week with more of the nation's newsmakers right here on Triangle Television. 
See you then. Bye for now. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.